Welcome to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. It's the last contango in London, but no butter is being used this time. Even if an investor lives 200 frickin' years, he'll never discover the vampire squid's true nature. An investor may be able to understand the secrets of the Fibonacci analysis, but he or she will never understand the truth about Goldman Sachs' tentacles of fraud and deception. Never, 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 Stacy. Max Kaiser. Matt Taibbi is out with another piece, and it features prominently Goldman Sachs. And this is the headline, The Vampire Squid Strikes Again, the Mega Bank's Most Devious Scam Yet. Banks are no longer just financing heavy industry. They are actually buying it up and inventing bigger, bolder, and scarier scams than ever. Now, this is the fallout from the Financial Services Modernization Act of 1999, also known as the Gramm-Leach-Bliley Act. Now, that overturned uh, Glass-Steagall, of course, but it also legalized new forms of monopoly, allowing banks to merge with heavy industry. A tiny provision in the bill also permitted commercial banks to delve into any activity that is, quote, complementary to a financial activity. Now, at the time that this was pushed, it was first pushed by J.P. Morgan, and they said in congressional testimony, they compared this complementary financial activity to something like American Express, which, which publishes the travel and leisure uh, magazine. It would just be something like that, just complementing each other. Well, we've seen this relationship between banks and heavy industry for a while in the oil industry. Mm. So the oil industry, which is capital intensive, they borrow lots and lots of money. And to the point where the U.S. dollar, for example, is collateralized by oil. You know, starting in the 1970s when the U.S. went off the gold standard and they went on the petrodollar, you see that the dollar, the U.S. dollar, is now backed by oil. And that's a merging, really, of heavy industry and currency manipulation and, and Wall Street debt creation. But what this Goldman Sachs Matt Taibbi piece is talking about is really the financialization of every single aspect of all industry uh, into nothing more than a way for banks to crank out more ever complicated financial widgets that are meant to destroy uh, the economy, the host in which this parasite lives. So Goldman Sachs, the parasite, has been given more uh, leeway to burrow ever deeper into the host, being the U.S. and the global economy. And no one has stood up to the parasite. Well, the banks in particular that benefited most from this are Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, and J.P. Morgan Chase. And he says regarding the oil industry, for example, this is just how deep the tentacles go. But banks aren't just buying stuff. They're buying whole industrial processes. They're buying oil that's still in the ground, the tankers that move it across the sea, the refineries that turn it into fuel, and the pipelines that bring it to your home. Then, just for kicks, they're also betting on the timing and efficiency of these same industrial processes in the financial markets, buying and selling oil stocks on the stock exchange, oil futures on the futures markets, swaps on the swaps market, etc. So there's a wholesale merger of banks and heavy industry. They control the entire process, much like, oh, we saw that back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, didn't we, with uh, communism, also control the entire process. Right. I mean, you do. it is a command and control, state-run, corrupt, fascist dictatorship, full stop. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a given. But what it does to uh, the economy as a whole and the ecology as a whole, remember that ultimately the collateral for the global economy is the ecology. Oil being a finite resource, Goldman Sachs and others have figured out a way to sell forward 100 years, 200 years, 300 years worth of oil, of energy resources, bring all that income into the present, put it into their pockets, and then sit back while you have a credit collapse and a, a peak oil situation emerge and you have uh, this massive inequality that has resulted from one bank working with others to bring into the present hundreds of years worth of income that would have been used to keep generations of Americans and people around the world alive. Uh, so they're basically stealing not only from everyone around the world today, but they figured out a way to steal from billions of people in the future. Well, so because these guys control everything from the swaps market, betting on the future outcome of oil production, but they also control the production, they, they always win. 
So, for example, they talk about arbitraging the contango. Now, remember back in 2009, early in the days of the financial crisis, remember we talked about contango and this oil contango. Well, the futures market was pricing oil much higher than it was today. Now, what happened there? It was because one of the participants in this was Coke Industries, and they had bought up cheap oil, put it onto tankers, I controlled the supply, made it seem scarce, and were sell, they were also controlling the futures market and selling it for much more in the future. But driving up the price of oil, they say it was up to 20 to 30 percent more because of this arbitraging the contango. Right. Well, this is where, let's say, Lloyd Blankfein runs Goldman Sachs. It should not be lauded as a good businessman or a financial wizard in some way. Because as you're pointing out here, using these financial products and financial futures markets, they have eliminated all risk of stealing money from the future. So stealing money from the present. Uh, stealing money from the future and abusing markets to make the risk of stealing this money zero. At least with somebody who is breaking into your home, stealing all of your jewelry and running away, there is a risk that they might get caught, they might get beat up, they might go to jail. But when Goldman Sachs runs, you know, breaks into your home, steals all of your goods and services and capital, essentially using all of his financial futures products, and then runs away without taking any risk, and then your kids end up having nothing to eat. They starve to death. Talk about crystal knock, Tom Perkins. Talk to Lloyd Blankfein about his crystal knock on your people. Okay? That's the guy you should be talking to. It's no risk capitalism, which of course is not capitalism at all. It's just theft. So these banks have taken control of the entire industrial process. Now, even the, the architect of this legislation, Jim Leach, who's now a professor, and he was a Republican congressperson at the time on the Financial Services and Banking Committee. He's shocked, he says, that they're doing this, that he didn't know that's what complementary financial activities meant. He thought it was just like these magazines that American Express has released. But also in 2012, the New York Fed also released a paper saying that they don't really know what it means, and it's quite ambiguous what that means. But there's another clause inside that 1999 Financial Services Modernization Act. And that is that any company that became a bank holding company after the passage of Graham Leach Bliley in 1999 could engage or control shares of a company engaged in commodities trading, but only if it was already doing so before a seemingly arbitrary date in 1997. So if you became a bank holding company after 1999, because nobody understood why this phrase was in there, what this clause even meant. Until, lo and behold, the 2008 financial crisis, Goldman Sachs became a bank holding company overnight. So did Morgan Stanley. And lo and behold, they could start buying up the entire industrial processes. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, you've got Jamie Dimon and Lloyd Blankfein committing, engaging in, partaking in, colluding in a scheme that is bankrupting the economy and creating multiple generations of disenfranchised, angry citizens while the rights of these citizens are being stripped to pay for this fraud. So what, what do you do about this? I mean, how do you react? I noticed, for example, there's no connection from, from what I understand, but up to 20 bankers have recently been found dead. That, that's a fact. We've got the four or five known examples of banker suicides, and we've got reports now that up to 20 bankers have been found dead. So either A, these are bankers who were going to blow the whistle on Lloyd Blankfein, and he had him taken out, uh, or these are bankers who have committed suicide because of the shame of being associated with Lloyd Blankfein. Imagine that you're associated with Lloyd Blankfein, and you know that your boss is committing a financial holocaust. Would you not be tempted to kill yourself? Is this not behind the rash of banker suicides around America and around the world? I think that's the cause. So let's go back to the story, because he mentions that, for example, we're still far behind in even trying to chase the frauds that previously happened, the earlier frauds from the mortgage-backed securities fraud. And now there's a LIBOR and Forex trading fraud. We, and this is, the, these are all these new frauds coming up. So he mentions the, the arbitrage and the contango in oil. Then he mentions the aluminum, or aluminum, as they call it in the UK, where Goldman Sachs controlled the Detroit aluminum, not, something like 70% of the market all went through there. But what they were doing was swapping it back and forth between warehouses, raising the rents, and charging 
charging a huge amount more for this aluminum. Now, the, there's a class action suit going on against Goldman Sachs for their role in the aluminum rigging. They're, by the way, they're, they're all getting out of the markets now that they've already, you know, the frauds are catching up to them and they've already defrauded the entire market. But Garrett Watkins, an Arizona-based class action attorney who was suing Goldman Sachs and others over the aluminum case on behalf of two major manufacturers, puts it this way. It's like that line in The Dark Knight Rises, he says. The storm isn't coming. The storm is already here. So what was that whole Dark Knight Rises but about they were demonizing Occupy Wall Street as, a, as if they would wanted to bring anarchy and chaos. And yet what he's rightly pointing out here is this manipulation of the the entire industrial process, the entire industrial process from beginning to end is raising prices, causing chaos and causing, they're the ones causing the chaos and anarchy that the, the film industry imagined that the normal people are causing. So this is a clear case of fascism. This is a clear case of, of uh, a small group of people committing uh, fraud on an industrial scale. Um, and as a result, you've got uh, wide-scale poverty, disease, ecological disaster. Uh, what, what, is the, what is the solution? Because we were told after war, World War II, remember, never again was the catchphrase after World War II. Never again would we see a Holocaust like World War II. And yet, w we're seeing it again. So why aren't the people being more proactively trying to stop it. Why aren't the folks who were the victims last time saying, you know what, we don't want this again. It, it, you know, it brings, it puts into, 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 into context the whole past 70 or 80 years of who's doing what to whom for what and for how much. Now, also the, the point here is that, you know, the financial collapse happened and because of that, Goldman Sachs became a bank holding company and because of the cheap 0% interest rates, they could buy up all these commodity warehouses. They also point out that the LME, the London Metals Exchange, is also being bought up by J Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan and uh, Glencore and, and Trafficker, which were both Mark Rich firms. Remember the famous market manipulator who went on the run and uh, Bill Clinton also, you know, who oversaw the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act? He uh, pardoned him. So they control the London Metals Exchange with zinc, copper, aluminum. The same thing is happening there. He's talking about the merry-go-round there. You're seeing signs of merry-go-round because you see over and over the cancel of the warrant, which is showing that there's a, a, a rise in a manipulation, basically. It could be a sign of that. Well, Matt Taibbi, another great job, another great article, you know, really covering the, um, this ongoing scourge yeah. of... Um, terrorism and uh, he does a good job anyway we got to go stacy thanks so much the last contango in london <laughs> indeed no butter for you stay tuned for the second half a whole lot more
crosstalk rules in effect, that means you can jump in anytime you want. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to turn to Jenny Jones, a Green Party member of the London Assembly. Jenny, welcome to the Kaiser Report. Thank you. It was a long way to come, obviously. <laughs> OK, fantastic. So I'm holding up this copy of the Bankers Mayor Report uh, that you've put together. So tell us about it. Well, it's very frustrating for somebody who um, is you know, has a philosophy about how things should be run and that society generally should protect the vulnerable, to find a mayor like Boris Johnson, who is acting so often entirely for the bankers here in London. And admittedly, they are an important service. They're 10% of the workforce, something like that. But at the same time, they are not doing their bit for London. And Boris Johnson seems to swallow everything they say um, w without any sort of doubt or hesitation. And that is very annoying. Now, uh, Mayor Boris Johnson claimed in a press release that hedge funds in the city of London contribute three billion pounds a year in tax. Um, of course, at the same time, we've learned about all these scandals in LIBOR, Forex, PPI, the gold fixing scandal, um, and all of these other, you know, crime spree that's gone on. So how do you balance, how does he balance, so what do you think about this idea? Well, they, they're committing fraud daily. HSBC is laundering money for Mexican drug cartels, but we need the tax revenue. Your thoughts? Well, I think if we were better at collecting tax, we perhaps wouldn't be quite so dependent on the financial sector that, as you say, is, is already cheating us. Last year, the bonuses, not just not the pay, but the bonuses of 2,500 city people could have brought every single person in London who is currently on poverty pay up to the London living wage. So 2,500 people's bonuses could actually have changed things for three quarters of a million people, actually meant that they could contribute to the economy, be out of um, poverty, pay tax themselves. So there are other ways of looking at this. And banking, to me, doesn't seem to be working for London. Well, yeah, it's interesting, too, that uh, this argument that the hedge funds and the uh, banking pro professionals bring in tax revenues, but yet the national debt of Britain keeps going higher and higher and higher. And the reason it goes higher is because the government makes it very easy for this financial fraud to take place, which needs a lot of debt creation. So the country is burdened with huge amounts of debt that keeps going higher to, uh, in exchange for an amount of a tax revenue that is not covering the debt. So just simple math to tell Boris Johnson that is his basic premise is flawed on a very basic level. The debt's going higher, correct? Well, uh, Chris Martin, who's a professor of economics at the University of Bath, says that we should be asking ourselves what sort of banking sector we actually want for the UK. What will actually benefit the economy and society the most? And he says it's one where savings should be channeled into things that are desirable, i.e. probably not into arm armaments, not into oil revenue, into things that actually help the majority of people. And as you say, the debt's going up. But at the same time, we're not collecting enough tax from people who, who are... It's not just tax avoidance, which they're very clever at. It's also tax evasion. Well, it's also uh, an underlying economic model that generates uh, more liabilities than assets. In other words, he's, they're digging a hole in this country uh, with, by allowing the banking sector free reign to commit fraud. And that hole is called debt. And instead of saying, stop, stop digging, Boris Johnson is saying, dig deeper. We want to be in debt more. He's increasing, he's exacerbating the debt problem by giving the city scamsters free reign. So why, uh, you know, how does that jive with this idea of austerity? Because, of course, the coalition government has the country on a program of austerity. Then magically, when the floods hit, David Cameron says, we're going to throw unlimited money at it. Suddenly, there's an unlimited pile of money. Is, is it financial illiteracy one of the big problems in this coalition government? 
Well, I think it's partly the fact that Conservatives understand, that they think they understand money better than other political parties. But actually, what I would say is they understand the price of things, but they don't understand the value. Who, who is advising uh, the mayor? <laughs> um, that's very difficult to say. I think probably he, um, he uh, hears from a variety of people who all have the same ideas and it's obvious from my report it was obvious that he swallows the financial sectors lines their press releases entirely without question he's not actually listening to academics he's not listening to people who might give him some some better ideas i mean for example in my report i say there are three things that the banking sector should do immediately and the first is of course separate the retail from the casino side the the investment side the second thing is that there should be a tobin tax a financial transactions tax because it, it's one of the ways that we can actually um, benefit society again. And, um, and the third thing, of course, is that banks should keep more of their assets, I mean, something like 10%, so that they are, um, they're not too big to fail. Well, here at the mayor's office, and we're in a, a new development called More London, uh, which has been some part of the regeneration, urban regeneration here in London. And walking around the streets here, you see big signs for KPMG, Ernst & Young, Deloitte Touche, uh, and there's another one of the big four. There's a, these boats that go up and down the Thames with the huge KPMG logo on them. Uh, these four big accounting firms and consultants who have been known to be engaging in massive uh, problematic schemes, uh, Arthur Anderson and Enron, for example, going back. And none of them have really, just like the banks have not gotten stopped their behavior of larceny, these big four accounting firms ha have not stopped their larceny either, their, their fraudulent behavior. And aren't they advising the mayor? Isn't there a sym symbiotic relationship between the mayor's larcenistic tendencies and these big four, big four accounting firms uh, need to, to let that happen? It's really good talking to you because you, your, your language is even stronger than my language <laughs> when you talk about larceny and so on. And you're, you're an expert. You've worked in the financial sector, and, and I haven't. I, I'm somebody who just sits over there and watches Boris moderately closely. Um, I don't know who he has meetings with, and it's an interesting question because, of course, I can ask who he has meetings with. But I would say that Probably he doesn't even need to have them because he is so um, he is so trusting. He thinks that the banking sector, the financial sector, really really benefits London, and he can't see any problems with it. So they might not even need to talk to him. You know, they might just um, sit back and just let him run with with what he's doing already. Well, the proximity of these firms and the mayor speaks volumes. And if you do any research in terms of the mayor of London, is not different than mayors in other countries and other states who are engaged in a similar kind of symbiotic relationship that somehow ends up channeling money to a few at the expense of the many. And I think that that, that, that needs to be looked in a little bit deeper. Now, you hosted a roundtable for the top three suggested reforms. Um, you talked about those, those top reforms. Are any of those three that you mentioned gaining any traction at all? It was a Tobin tax, the increase of reserves for banks, and um, the third one was separate the two. Separate the glass, yeah. separate the casino yeah. bank from the savings bank. Yeah. Are any of those reforms gaining any traction at all? Well, uh, certainly not with the mayor, as far as I know. In fact, he has lobbied the European Commission on three occasions. The first one was on air quality, which is fair enough. But the other two times have both been on behalf of the financial sector. And once was against the Tobin tax. He cannot see why um, that's, that's so important to, to Britain. So, uh, no, I would say none of these ideas is gaining traction at all. OK, let's uh, broaden our discussion a little bit, because all of these problems that you mentioned are fueled by cheap money, artificially low interest rates, some would argue, the zero interest rate policies. And in this country, you've got the Mon Monetary Policy Committee, Bank of England, Mark Carney over there at the Bank of England, and they are the, the vortex of this cheap money. Would it make sense for the Green Party to say, look, we want representation on the Monetary Policy Committee. We want our say, because in order to weed out the parasites, you've got to make the environment inhospitable to parasites. And that means raising interest rates. Even though it, the homeowners are going to balk, if you want to get rid of the parasites and the criminals in the city, you've got to raise interest rates. Where, where are you on this idea? 
Well, um, first of all, this is way out of my depth, OK? Because th th this, is, um, this is something that the Green Party does have policy on. But our view, I think, generally is that um, you don't have to have a Green there necessarily. You have to, or rather, you don't need the Green Party there necessarily. But you certainly need somebody there who understands firstly about climate change and secondly about how society can sort of work when it's a more equal society because clearly the more unequal the society the less happy everybody is it isn't just the poor people who are unhappy the rich are unhappier as well and we see that when we look at scandinavian countries that are that are more fair well there's a risk societies. of social unrest and it's that, great to be rich but if you're being you know your head's on a pike somewhere by the tower of london it's maybe not so great to be rich and that's the risk that they're taking sure. historically when inequality gets to these extremes you have uh revolutions i mean in this country russell brand okay is calling for a revolution he hasn't articulated it yet i mean it's a notable event because he's an extremely well-known figure he's internationally well known he goes on mainstream media calling for a revolution um what you know your yeah. your what what are your thoughts well he also called on people not to vote which i think is an abysmally stupid thing to say if you don't vote your voice isn't heard it's all very well um, being out on protests and so on. I still go on protests, even though I'm an elected politician. But the fact is, if you don't have elected people there speaking for you, then you have no voice. And politics is all about where the money goes. It's who says who gets what. And, and you have to be involved in politics. P politics is part of, of everything. I, I would say on, on Boris generally, um, he is, I think, a lost cause now. And we just have to wait for another mayor to, to come along who a, understands about a more equal society, and B, who understands that um, climate change is happening and we have to mitigate and we have to adapt. And that's something that he hasn't grasped, which is intensely infuriating. You mentioned climate change, uh, Green Party, obviously, environmentally focused. Is there anyone on the conservative side, the Tory side, that is, you could reach out to? I mean, the name that comes to mind is Zach Ultimate, who was the editor of The Ecologist magazine, who's outspoken on these issues. He is a Tory, yes, uh, but he seems to get it. Yeah, yeah. Does it make, has there been any coalition between Greens and, and, and some Tories? What's going on? It's, it's not easy to have a coalition between political parties unless it's really organized, just like the, the coalition government that we've got. But certainly, of course, there are conservatives who, who think like this. I mean, the conserve part of conservatives actually do care about the natural environment. They understand that things are changing. And, if, and you know, some of them are probably farmers. They, they see on a daily basis that climate change is happening. Um, and I, as a Green, I know that it's very hard to get my agenda across if I don't look for support. So I'm a very cooperative Green, and I work with, I even work with, well, I work with all, with all the political parties if it's, if it's appropriate. All right, Jenny Jones, I would have loved to speak with you some more, but we have to go. We're out of time. Thanks for being on the Kaiser Report. Thanks for having me. Okay, and that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I'd like to thank our guest, Jenny Jones, Green Party member of the London Assembly and author of this fantastic report, uh, The Banker's Mayor. If you'd like to get in touch with us, tweet us at Kaiser Report. Until next time, bye, y'all.